Wyoming, uh, Whistler, Toronto, Seattle, all over the place. And um, I even did Top Chef Canada a few years back. Uh, I didn't win, but I, I, I competed. And um, during that time as a chef, I began to kind of notice a few things that were wrong with the system. So being from the amount of food that we throw away, um, just in commercial kitchens alone is, is like astounding, right? These compost bins and garbage cans are full, full, full all the time, especially in big operations, like big hotels. I was working in some 450 plus room hotels. And uh, the spoilage. So that picture on the left there is a case of bok choy that we received from a supplier and it's, it's spoiled. And this is a, a common occurrence. So fast forward to current events, current recent events, um, with the COVID pandemic, severe weather affecting supply chains, with the highway washed out, um, walking into the grocery stores and seeing empty shelves was a little bit alarming for me. So this was kind of coincided with this competition, so I decided to go into the competition with a vertical farm idea. So seeing those issues, seeing the concept, it kind of led me to begin digging a little bit deeper. And this is when I started doing research and finding out some really astounding numbers. So 30% of the food produced globally every year is wasted, and that equates to 1.6 billion tons of food, whether it's contaminated, spoiled, or thrown away at, um, sorry, contaminated at the source, spoiled during transport, or thrown away. And that contaminated food equates to one, uh, 600 million foodborne illness cases per year. Um, the environmental impact. So traditional farming um, creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions uh, with 24% of the total greenhouse gas emissions coming from farming and then an additional 14% in transport. So trucks going from farms to warehouses to warehouses to farms or to grocery stores. Canadian food, 30% of it's imported with, a, with most of it coming from the US, Mexico and Chile, which means that your produce travels on average about 2,500 kilometers before it reaches the grocery store. And then also too, agriculture is using, um, is the biggest uh, consumer of fresh water in the world, like 70%. And then in addition there, there's some toxic runoff that can cause algae blooms. The increase in demand, so here's the big one. So the United Nations projects that the population, the global population will reach 9.7 billion by 2050, which is a 22% increase from current um, population. And currently 68% of us are living in urban centers, but that's going to increase up to, like, there's estimated around 90% of people will be living in urban city centers by 2050. And that equates to a 70% um, food production increase needed to supply that, that growth. So th that number I'll touch on a little bit later too, but that's like the size of Brazil. So we need enough, we need more farmland about the size of Brazil to feed this growing population that doesn't exist at this farmland, and I'll talk about that in a bit too. So these guys, these are the Ghostbusters I call them, so they're spraying chemicals, pesticides. So um, who here washes their produce when they buy it from the grocery store? Okay, it's good, but in some cases it doesn't really matter because the pesticides leach into the soil, they're absorbed through the roots, they're absorbed through the leaves, and a lot of that stuff, some of the stuff stays in there and you can't wash it out. So these are some of the most common pesticides used in traditional, not in, and I should elaborate too, it's not just the traditional small farming or the organic farming or the home settings, but the big agribusiness, the big fields that are producing millions and millions and tons of stuff. So these are the four main ones that are, are the nasty ones, cancer, you name it, birth defects, not stuff that we want in our food or should be in our food. So part of the solution, along with the home setting, along with the organic farming, Vertical farming or controlled environment container farming is the solution and the concept that I brought to this competition. So by with one of these controlled environment modular farms, we can grow 12 months of the year. We use 90% less water than traditional farming. We use 95% less land than traditional farming. Zero chemical pesticides. Um, it's protected from the elements and it allows things to be hyper-local. So like as in you can grow produce for the grocery store in their parking lot kind of thing. Um, the 90% less water, so because it's a hydroponic system, it's on like a closed loop. There's dehumidifiers that are reclaiming water from the air. Um, anyways, this is the technology. So th this specific unit is, um, is one from Grocer, and I'll touch base on these, this company as well here. Um, but with this unit, it's the size of a shipping container, so it's container farming. Um, and it would allow me to grow anywhere from 1,200 plants to 3,200 plants at one time in the size of a shipping container. 
and that's on a, on a rotation, so you'd be cropping 700 plants every week, or 700 heads of lettuce or herbs or whatever you choose to grow. Um, the things that we can grow in container farming or vertical farming, so today there's um, about 140 different types. It is limited to leafy greens, um, lettuces, herbs, you know, microgreens. Strawberries and f like flowering plants, like tomatoes and stuff, are being researched and working on now. You just need manual uh, pollination for these kind of things, right? Because of the closed nature of the, of the container, you, can, you don't have bees or anything to pollinate. So you have to do it by hand and it's very um, labor extensive, intensive. <laughs> yes. So the different types of hydroponic systems. So the, the, the system that I was looking at uses this NFT or nutrient film technique, but there is other um, types of um, hydroponics. Um, even aeroponics too that spray the roots with nutrient solution or there's the ebb and flow on that floods the tray and drains which I have a little bit of experience with um, for my life. and it's super technology dependent so um, if your computer systems or your nutrient even nutrient systems that help you feed the plants the right way with the right amount of nutrients those then the whole thing kind of gets thrown for a loop there Vertical farming at home, so this is not just some big big ordeal. You can do this in small scale too. So these little vertical pots here are good for backyard gardens. This is kind of similar to what Kate's using for her berries in, um, in Tappan. Uh, these are homemade um, PVC hydroponic systems that you can build. And you just need a little bit of water pump. And then also too, you can do it on the fence on the fence there. This I thought was a really creative one where the water just runs down like a waterfall, cascades down through the plants. It's pretty neat. I thought. So the future of vertical farming. So will vertical farms replace traditional farming? No, they won't. So there's no, there's no, the scale from traditional farming and the, and the, the sheer size and production of it, there's no way to replace it. This is meant to help, this is meant to supplement the increase in, in demand. Um, like I said before, 80% of the arable land, and arable means farmable land in the world, already being used and there's quite a bit of it that's been lost already. Um, like I mentioned, the size of Brazil is what needed over the next 20, 30 years. That's, if we planted, if we planted that size, it's the amount of food that we need to grow. Um, why it's, a, why, again, why it's a, vertical farming is important is it's conserving resources. So it's a, it's a, it's a higher yield, better for, the, better for the planet way to grow things. Um, the two most important things of why kind of this technology has taken off to you is food security for remote communities. So these container farms are all over the north, up north in the Arctic. They're in Antarctica. Um, it's allowing people to have, who didn't have access to fresh produce before or were paying extremely large amounts of money for it, to have it. Um, and then off, the last little piece I threw in there too is it's the future of food for, for space exploration. I know it seems kind of silly, but this is how they're gonna grow food on Mars. So um, they're actually doing it right now. So they're growing food in, on this International Space Station in a, in a little closed kind of growing thing that's similar to a vertical farm. But I thought it was kind of neat that it's, that's the technology that they're going to be using to, to move out into space. So some sources, again, I just threw these in there because I had to. Um, so you guys don't think I'm just talking about <laughs> talking, making things up. So a lot of them I pulled from like the uh, United Nations uh, Agriculture Canada, obviously grocer, the Organic Food Council. So that's pretty much all I've got. I know it was very short, and there's, uh, if I may, there's Miss Kate back there from Reckling Ridge Berry Farm. Um, she uh, was one of the mentors for Entrepreneur, so I got to pick her brain a little bit for this for this um, presentation. And um, I hoped this was a project and a concept. It's, it's taking a long time as with any business to kind of bring it to fruition. I hope to one day bring this kind of technology or container farming to Salmon Arm, but it's, it's a slow road. So it's a very expensive um, adventure for me. So um, it's, a, it's a work in progress. So hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, have our stuff in the grocery store. Thank you very much. Thank you.